So hello everyone. Um, are you interested about uh, football at all? Are you excited about Switzerland playing today? <laughs> well, I'm excited about the spider cam that you see there. I don't know if you've noticed these nice shots we get where there's this camera flying around and you can see behind the free kick when it takes place and so on. Well, I think it's so exciting that actually I cannot believe the next World Cup won't have this as well. And that's kind of the first um, uh, argument that, that uh, I would like to make today. Expectations of viewers are set by the equipment used in video productions. Um, so 50 years ago, if there was a zoom uh, lens that could get you to see the athlete, that was already exciting enough. But today, we cannot imagine watching the final of a Grand Slam without getting these close-ups where you can practically see the sweat coming off uh, Roger's head. Um, or even these slow-motion replays where you can see his muscle outline when he's taking a shot. Right? So the fact that we can see these shots tells us that the technology to produce them is there. But why do we only get them at these high-end productions? I would like to have, this, to have this kind of shot when I play tennis with my friends. <laughs> Not sure who else would like to see it, but it, it would be something, something I would like to have for myself. Well, maybe it's not a surprise, but it takes a lot of effort to make this happen. Um, there is actually more than 20 cameras, <coughs> manned cameras, in the Wimbledon final. Uh, and it's also a big effort in the, in the back end. There is a track typically outside of an event like this that's making sure that the color grading of the cameras is correct, the switching between views is correct, the replays are done correctly, and so on. So in order to add the intelligence into the shots that we see and enjoy as viewers, a huge army of, of operators and people is needed. And what we are doing, we are creating software that makes robots do similar things. We add the intelligence to robots to produce this kind of quality productions at scale. And my background, as, as Hugo mentioned, is in automatic control. And this is a field where you operate with this very complex diagram that you see up there. <laughs> <laughs> it includes three key steps. Okay, we first measure something, um, then we compare it to how we would like it to be, and then we take corrective action. And we call this feedback, and it's basically our daily job. We use feedback for everything. And actually, you use feedback for everything as well. Uh, when you bake a cake, uh, you also do the same thing. You take it out, you stick your little uh, whatever you do there to check the density of, of the cake. Um, and based on that density, you then uh, compare to what you were expecting it to be, assuming you've done it before. Um, and then you take corrective action. Right? You either take it out because it's ready, or you, you put it back in, lower the, the tray, put up the heat, whatever. And then we use the same kind of um, loop, the same three steps for complex problems, like autonomous parking. There we measure all the time the distance to the cars, the distance to the wall, and we compare it to what would be safe. And then as a third step, we correct by steering the car uh, right in there. So when we talk about autonomous camera robots, because that's what this is about, autonomous camera men, we follow the same exact principle. And there are similar requirements that fit exactly in this loop. The first thing is about measuring the scene, understanding what exactly is going on there. And the second step is to compare to what a cinematographer, a professional operator, would like this to be like, what the director wants to have. And based on these two things, you then take corrective action. You will steer the camera, that's what operators do, to make sure that the framing is right, the view is nice for the viewers. Now, what we have done is built a technology pipeline that covers these three steps um, in this segment of, of automation. And what I would like to show you now on, on the monitor is the live view coming out of this uh, robot that we have installed there on the right of the, of the audience uh, deck. And you can see that it can recognize me, it can recognize even my phone, hopefully. Yeah. It can recognize my shape. And actually, the accuracy of, this, of these tools, these are neural networks, uh, the accuracy in a lot of cases surpasses that of humans. And this is extremely impressive, and it's an, uh, a development that was done only in the last five years that we got this kind of accuracy out of these systems. Now, I find this fascinating because it happened due to two things that were maybe not, a, not targeting to create this. One is this, the data that we have online. When we take a selfie and we put this up on, on the cloud, somebody is taking that and then training a neural network to detect people. And that's, for me, fascinating that all these silly photos actually create uh, research. And the second thing is that we get access to low-cost processing power. These are graphical processing units, CPUs, that you may have heard, because online gamers use them when they play uh, these games that you often see your children playing. And because they do this at such a large scale, now researchers get access to this equipment at very low cost. So to put it very, very simply, 
if you can play the latest first-person shooter game uh, at full graphic detail, then you can run the same neural networks that Facebook is uh, creating in their labs. That's, that's, that's quite impressive. Now, the second step in autonomous camera men has to do with how we compare what we get in the scene, the measurement, to what it should be like. This is a bit trickier because it requires us to know what is cinematograph cinematographically optimal. And there are two ways that you can do that. Um, you can either ask people on how they do it and try to infer from that. But the problem is that cases vary a lot. It's different what you do on a stage like this, where things are kind of static, maybe I'm moving around a bit, and it's, it's kind of simple. And it's different if we're talking about uh, a racetrack, where cars are, are running around, right? The way to do it is different. So the way we do it is we use machine learning to, to parse the scene and understand what the object is, is doing. We compare this to what other operators are doing in this exact field, and we try to extract what is the relevant data to then create um, an autonomous cinematographer. I have here a simple example that you can uh, hopefully see on the, on the monitor behind me. Here what we do is we train this robot to adjust the framing according to where the presenter is looking at. And a, a professional cin cinematographer would tell you that if you look straight down the camera, then it should be somewhere in the middle that it frames you. If you switch towards one direction and you look uh, there, then the framing should adjust in order for the image to look nice. And if you switch to another direction, then again, the framing of the operator should adjust in order for this to look nice, right? Now, if you try to do this at scale, to make it over, over all different cases that, that um, uh, cinematographers take care about, you would, could not go ahead and ask them. Uh, this would, would not scale up. So what we are doing in the lab is we are really taking all these different cases and extracting the relevant data so that we can then create specific uh, intelligent systems to uh, adjust cinematography. Now, the third step is the corrective step. Right? We have to correct based on these things. And here, what we do is something we call dynamic framing optimization. What we're trying to do, actually, is balance between a correct frame and the transients, how the camera moves so that it looks human, it looks nice to the viewer. And this is tricky because if you simply try to correct, then you get footage that doesn't look human. And we got this feedback a lot when we showed uh, what we are developing to professional uh, video production companies. So for us, this, been a key this has been a key challenge, how to balance between uh, these two things. So what we do is we create an optimization problem, which we run uh, multiple times per second, uh, in which we optimize exactly this trade-off between optimal framing, that's a static situation, optimal framing in, in, in the view, and the transient. So what you will see now live is how this works with our system enabled, so optimizing this when I'm trying to make some sort of movement around. So the, the, the point is that this, when I, when I oscillate around the point, the result that you're getting is still uh, pleasant. You can still watch it, right? If we disable this and we try to do just simple control, steering, trying to get the right framing as fast as possible, then what you get is, is, is disturbing because the movement is too much. The system is trying to put me at the right place. It overshoots a bit. It's what a robot would do if it tries to, uh, to do that. So really, this optimization thing is extremely important. And that's why us being control engineers helps in making this robot uh, human. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is addressing kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, we're making an autonomous cameraman, right? Does this mean that no jobs will exist for camera operators? Well, the answer is no, because this is a tool, right? And no operator likes sitting behind a camera framing a guy like me now over the whole day, right? You, you can ask. They don't enjoy doing that. And they like creative things. And tools like these autonomous robots uh, that you direct, these are tools that people can then become more people, right? So now we take a human brain and we put it behind a single camera. With these tools, one human brain will be able to produce uh, the whole World Cup games that we watch today. And this is what we're striving for. We're trying to create these high-quality uh, high events for everyone, democratize it. Um, and this is why, in, in five years' time, I expect to have our systems everywhere, and, and you will be able to tell that you saw this first uh, today here. So, thank you very much for listening to me. And <laughs>